this is a legal definition and it's made by lawyers for lawyers in order to judge people. And so once you start applying it to history, you have a lot of problems. For example, um, I'm Australian and in Australia, can you call um, what happened in Australia as genocide? So British people came to Australia, there was a continent flourishing and full of people. Within a hundred years, there was almost no one left. Um, in Tasmania, where I'm from, they made a line of soldiers and they walked them across the entire island. They walked them south to north and shot anyone they could find. By the early 19th, early 20th century, there was not a single full blood Tasmanian Aboriginal left. Is that genocide or is it settler, settler colonialism? Right. Um, at where do you where do you draw the line? And this is sort of debates that are continuing to go on. Um, and one thing that scholars are increasingly finding is that talking about the Holocaust as a genocide is not actually that useful in terms of understanding it. It's useful for um, for putting people in prison or punishing them um, for what they did, but not not so useful in terms of having a scholarly sense of what went on and therefore how can we prevent it in the future. And scholars are asking various questions. Um, and one of the most important is about timing. So if you ask the average person on the street what caused the Holocaust, the answer is anti-Semitism. But anti-Semitism comes from the late Roman Empire. Um, it was very strong in medieval Europe. People blamed Jews for the crucifixion of Christ, the plague. Um, they would probably blame them for coronavirus if... Um, in the same sort of way, you get people like George Soros implicated in that. But just because you're anti-Semitic doesn't mean you're going to try to wipe out an entire people group. Uh, and this is the problem that the historians have as to how do you go from centuries old hatred to mass murder? And what are the, what are the mechanisms that suddenly flick the switch and make a society try to do that? Um, one of the really influential books that came out in the year 2000 on this topic is Neighbours by Jan Gross. Um, and it's a st story of a town, uh, more of a village in Poland in 1941, Jedwabne. And Gross points out there were very few Nazis around. Um, the Germans had not told them that they want to kill the Jews. There had been no announcement about we're going we're gonna to have a Holocaust now. Um, in the summer of 1941, Gross writes, half of the Polish town of Jedwabne, they murdered the other half. 1,600 men, women, and children, all but seven of the town's Jews. It was coordinated, it was organized by the local Poles. Um, why? And it, it clearly wasn't Hitler had given an order and therefore everyone decided to wipe them out. So Hitler's anti-Semitism really has very little to do with this sort of killing. Um, Jan Gross became very unpopular in Poland, which has a fairly right-wing government these days because of this book. And then in 2015, he pointed out that during the Second World War, Poles killed more Germans, more Jews than they killed Germans. So they killed about 10,000 Germans um, in resistance against the German occupation, but hundreds of thousands of Jews, um, Polish people murdering Jews. Uh, and he was taken to court for this. And if he enters Poland again, he'll be put in prison because a lot of people don't like to talk about the idea that um, Poles were perpetrators too. In, in Poland, so roughly 2 million people, 2 million po ethnic Polish people were killed during the Holocaust. Um, they were murdered by Germans and Soviet invaders. And the Second World War is a national tragedy for Poland. And then, therefore, to come along and say, well, actually, you guys caused, did the Holocaust, that's, it's, it hurts national pride. Um, and this is why a lot of this research in Eastern Europe is very um, sensitive. More recently, um, looking at similar pogroms, Jean-Paul Himka um, has studied the Lviv pogrom in 1941. So this is Eastern Poland. And the, the perpetrators were mostly Ukrainians here. Um, what we can see from the photographs and from eyewitness accounts is, to a certain extent, there, were, there was a feeling of Carnival. Um, Carnival is a medieval festival where the peasants would act as if they're lords, and then the lord gets like teased and picked on as if he's a peasant. The society's turned upside down. All the social norms, um, they're not they're not allowed to function anymore temporarily, and it's just for a day, and then everything goes back to normal. 
Um, and the way that they they mocked the Jews during the pogrom makes it look and feel like um, they had a festival atmosphere uh, and they're torturing these people because they enjoy it. Um, but one thing, one other thing that Jean-Paul Hinkel points out is these are not just anyone who is doing this. Um, the Ukrainians who cooperated with the Germans in these executions were not actually civilians. They weren't just random people off the street. They were members of the militia, um, the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, which is a nationalist organization in Ukraine dedicated to trying to create a, a nation state, like trying to get a country for Ukraine because it was under Polish and Russian rule and had been for, for centuries. And just because they're not in uniforms doesn't mean that they don't already know each other and they're not organized into some sort of thing. And so trying to work out who the killers are is often very difficult when you get to the level of something like a pogrom. One book that came out in 2018 is Intimate Violence by Jeffrey Kopstein and Jason Wittenberg. And these guys are political scientists. And so whereas historians are usually used to using uh, eyewitness accounts and let's just describe what happened and I'll tell you a story about it, these guys wanna make graphs. And they say, we've got an experiment here because in, let's tank a sample of maybe 30 towns in Poland, 15 of them had pogroms like in Yedvan there and 15 of them didn't. Why did the ones that did kill their Jews and the ones that didn't, did not kill their Jews? What was it that caused mass violence to happen in some places and not others? And the conclusion is that it was not the state. The German, the German state or even the Polish state had nothing to do with causing or even uh, sponsoring this. In general, it didn't occur where economic competition between Jews and non-Jews were fiercest. Um, because some people say, well, it was because the Jews had all the money. So it's not, it's not about economic competition. And they say it's also not about communism because there's lots of accusations that people killed the Jews because the Jews were communists. Um, when you look at it, um, statistically, it doesn't work like that. Anti-Semitism, you find anti-Semitism in the cities, in the town villages where they do kill the Jews and where they don't kill the Jews. So it's a necessary background condition, but it's not the thing that triggers the violence. Uh, we contend that the pogroms represented a strategy whereby non-Jews attempted to rid themselves of those whom they thought would be future political rivals. And they say in those villages where there were lots of Jews and those Jews had organized a political party that were asking for Jewish equality rights, um, and those parties were successful, those were the villages where you were more likely to see mass violence against Jews as opposed to not. Um, so they found a pattern. And it's not the patterns that we'd been expecting because we'd been expecting anti-Semitism, um, the army, prior, prior experiences of violence, economic competition, um, and those things, they were important, but they were not the thing that differentiated villages where they killed and villages where they didn't kill from each other. Um, and you see this very clearly in the Ukrainian-Polish ethnic cleansing. So in Volhynia and Galicia, this is areas in Eastern Poland or what we call Western Ukraine these days. In 1941, the Einsatzgruppen units, these are units where when the, the Wehrmacht, the German army conquers a region, um, their job is just to secure the region and to stop partisan units taking it over. And then behind them come a special SS units called Einsatzgruppen. And those groups, their job is to rid the area of Jews. So they would go into a village, they would round them up uh, and they would kill them. And normally you would go in one day and kill the men and then come back the next day for the women and children. Uh, sometimes a, a killing action would involve eight hours straight of just standing and shooting people one after another you're covered in blood and bone. Um, it's extremely traumatic for the killers, um, not to mention the, the victims. And because this was taking such a toll on the German troops, they eventually start recruiting um, locals, in particular Ukrainians, to, to carry out the violence for them. And so they train them in how to do these killing operations. And then in March of 1943, most of these Ukrainians leave the forest uh, sorry, leave, leave the SS, tank to the forest, form their own units and go on a killing spree, killing Poles. Because over the, during the 1930s, the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists had been asking for equal rights 
um, for Ukrainians inside Poland and they hadn't been receiving them. And when they start a terrorist campaign, um, the so assassinating public officials in order to get their message across, the Poles, um, the Polish government responds with a brutal pacification, they called it, um, campaign where they would just raise entire villages to the ground in the late 1930s. And so the Ukrainians are very angry about this. And they say, if we want to have a Ukrainian state, we need to make sure there are no Polish people living in this area anymore. And so they go through and mass murder 60,000, 80,000 Poles in Bohemia, um, but they're also killing them in Galicia. And sometimes the Poles will get organized and they would kill Ukrainians back. And so in the midst of the violence of the Second World War, when you've got armies fighting armies, and you've also got Einsatzgruppen units killing Poles, killing Jews, then you've got local villages killing Jews. You've also got this other war going on simultaneously of Ukrainian partisan units fighting Poles and ethnic cleansing people. Um, normally they would, they would go into a village, they would round up all the people in the village into the church and then set fire to the church or the town hall um, and anyone that tries to escape is shot. Timothy Snyder probably wrote the best book about this in 1999 and he argues that Ukrainian partisans who mass murdered Poles in 1943 followed the tactics they learned as collaborators in the Holocaust in 1942. Detailed advanced planning and site selection, persuasive assurances to local populations prior to actions, sudden encirclements of settlements, and then physical elimination of human beings. The Ukrainians learned the techniques of mass murder from the Germans because it's, it's almost identical what they're doing. And so one thing this tells us is that violence begets violence. Once you start a cycle of violence and you take away um, the normal human um, social rules that, that stop people killing each other, um, mass violence can break out. And this has led uh, a guy named Christian Gerlach to argue that we shouldn't be talking about Holocaust and we shouldn't be talking about genocide in particular because genocide assumes one group kills one other group. Whereas what we see here are extremely violent societies where you've got multiple victim groups and multiple perpetrator groups. Um, and so it's not just Jews being killed, it's also Poles and Roma and Ukrainians and Russians. Um, it's not just the state, the state's involved, um, but it's not only state actors who are doing it, it's diverse social groups and they're not doing it for one reason. Someone might kill because they for greed, another person might kill for revenge, another person might kill from anti-Semitism. Um, there's a variety of reasons. And so he says what we should be asking ourselves is why does a society that's otherwise peaceful suddenly become extremely violent? Um, and then how does it stop? How does it wrap itself up? Um, and this, this book, he tries to explain that by looking not just at the Holocaust, but a host of other genocides through the 20th century. Um, to, to make that point more clearly, um, you have two to three million Soviet prisoners of war die during the Holocaust, roughly two million Poles, up to 1.5 million Romani, the problem with Roma is that they often didn't register with the state because these people had been slaves for, for several centuries in Eastern Europe and they didn't trust the state. And whenever the state does get involved in Roma communities, it never ends well for the Roma. And so they don't register and we have no real idea of numbers. Uh, and they don't uh, write them down the same way, the, the killers don't write them down the same way that they did with Jews. They killed 200 to 250,000 disabled people the first people who were murdered in the Holocaust were disabled children in Germany, um, but murdered with gas, sorry. Um, the, the state, the Nazis wanted to try killing by gas. And so they said, um, let's try it on this hospital. And they wrote to the parents of a hospital with disabled children in it. And they said, your child is too sick to live. We're going to euthanize them. And all of the parents signed forms saying, yes, that's okay. Uh, and then they killed them all. Um, up to 200,000 Freemasons died during the Holocaust. The largest attack on Freemasons actually happens in Spain, where Franco turns around and massacres all the Freemasons he could find together with their families, because Freemasonry was associated with liberalism and democracy um, through the 19th century and early 20th century, um, but it's also associated with money. And many of the leading politicians in Spain um, before before 
fascism arises, were, were Freemasons and they had a lot of money. And so to fund his regime, basically, he, he wants to take all their land. Uh, 5,000 to 15,000 homosexuals, 2,500 to 5,000 Jehovah's Witnesses. Russian prisoners of war um, were a particular problem for, for Hitler because they often weren't highly, uh, in the early years of the war, um, before Stalingrad and Leningrad, these were the, the battles that really um, Stalin got the message across during battles like Stalingrad that if you don't fight for me, you will die. Um, a lot of the, the soldiers, they weren't highly motivated, and so they surrendered in large numbers. And Hitler didn't want to look after them. And so he puts them in overcrowded camps. He pranks them on long death marches. He starves them to death. He just doesn't feed them and doesn't let them out. And um, so two to three million Russian prisoners of war die in, in the German hands. But we also know from, from Nazi sources that the plan wasn't just to kill Jews. Jews were step one. Um, they also had genocidal plans against Poles and Belarusians and eventually Russians. Um, he, he needed this, this room, this Lebensraum. Uh, and the way that they worked it out, I assume you come across this idea of um, your, your global footprint. It's an idea that was invented by, I think it was BP, British Petroleum, in the 1990s to convince people that actually it's not our fault that the climate change is happening, it's your fault because of your lifestyles. And so you can type into a computer and algorithm, you tell it about your life and it says, we actually would need three Earths if everyone lived like you. So they used that sort of calculation. Um, they had accountants doing the work and economists. Um, how many people can this amount of land reasonably sustain? How many people are there Germans? How many people therefore do we have to massacre in order to sustainably live on the land um, in an ecologically sound way? Um, so that's, that's sort of an overview of, of what's happening in, in the East around Poland and Ukraine. But I wanna turn briefly to Croatia and then to Romania, which are the two cases that I know best. And these are quite different. So Croatia is interesting because it doesn't have a long history of anti-Semitism. In fact, most of the time when, um, the, the, in places like Romania or Hungary, you've got strong anti-Semitic political parties um, and a long history of organized anti-Semitic discourse. Whereas Jews were quite popular in Croatia, um, you don't have anti-Semitic newspapers, there's no organized political parties until the late 1930s. And it appears really suddenly um, in most other places. It's from like the 1870s or 1880s. But Croatia appears fairly late. And the, the fascist party was formed in 1929 when the king abolishes democracy be, um, the king of Yugoslavia and makes himself a royal dictator. And the Ustasha party were people who said, no, we can't handle this. Um, and so they said, what we need is a strong Croatia, Cro Croatia for the Croats. Uh, and they lived in exile for about 10 years until, or more than 10 years, about 12 years, until Italy invades Croatia and then Germany invades. And they, they create the independent state of Croatia and they put the Ustasha movement, the fascists in charge of that. And the fascists very quickly decide um, we need to mass murder people. And they start, they round up all the Jews in Zagreb in particular, and they put them in concentration camps. Um, and then they start mass, mass murdering them in the concentration camps bef well before the Germans begin. So there's, there's long de big debates um, over when the Holocaust actually begins because in the summer of 1941 is when Operation Barbarossa begins. And that's when Hitler decides, I'm winning the war in the West, I'm going to conquer Russia, the Soviet Union. And he turns to the East. Um, and that's when you get killings uh, and pogroms and the Einsatzgruppen units going around and systematically clearing the area of Jews. But there's no order from Hitler saying, from now on, we're going to have a Holocaust until January 1942. And if you think about it, if you're going to organize, to round up all the Jews in a massive empire, put them all in camps in one place and then execute them, you need soldiers for this, you need gendarmes, you need trains, um, you need food. So you've got, to, you've got to tell the guy in charge of the trains, 
you've got to tell the people in charge of the various provinces in your empire that this is going to happen. Um, and so they don't start organizing it until January 1942 at the, what we call the Vansi Conference. And that's significant because if Hitler took the decision to, to carry out the final solution in summer of 1941, that means that the, the, um, the Holocaust is a reflection of victory of the Nazis, right? They, they thought they were winning. They said, let's do what we've always been planning to do. But if he makes the decision to carry out the final solution in January 1942, that's um, the fear of defeat. January 1942, they're suddenly bogged down in the Russian winter. They realize they're not going to be able to do the Blitzkrieg um, war that they that carried out in Western Europe. They were in for the long haul. It was going to be bloody and they might not win. And therefore, the Holocaust becomes a, oh, no, we're going to lose. Let's kill as many Jews as we can before we do. Um, and after January 1942 that the, the killings in concentration camps begin, um, but not in Croatia. In Croatia, it begins much earlier. And the first people they round up are Jews, um, and they kill them very quickly. Uh, only 9,000 Croatian Jews survived the war. And it's worth noticing, um, if you have a look at this map, everything in pink is partisan movements. And you'll notice the strong past partisan involvement around Volhynia, um, near Kiev and below Minsk. That's where the Ukrainian Polish ethnic cleansing is taking place. So in areas where the German troops have the least control, that's where the most mass violence is happening on the ground. And the same happens in Croatia. Uh, if you look at the independent state of Croatia, half of it is not under the control of the Croats. Um, so Tiso's partisan, Tito's partisans are there. Um, but so are a variety of other groups, um, including Jewish groups. Um, these often, these are ethnically based partisan groups and they harass, they harass the official forces, but they also um, fight each other. Basically, it's a survive if you can sort of war. In Slovakia, you have a similar sort of regime um, in puppet regime. So Josef Tiso, he is a Jesuit priest. He's uh, been part of the, um, the Linka Guard, they call it, or the Slovak People's Party. And the Slovak People's Party is created in the 1890s, I think it was, in order to fight against the Habsburg Empire, to say we need civil rights for Slovaks. And then after 1918, Slovakia becomes part of Czechoslovakia, and they still don't have civil rights. And so they start fighting for civil rights, and it's... Um, it's a movement led mostly by Catholic priests, but the um, what do I want to say? The they increasingly take on fascist tactics and aesthetics. Like they start wearing uniforms, they start marching, they start saluting like a fascist, they start talking like fascists during the 1930s. And the one guy in the party who really resists this is Josip Tiso, because he wants to do power sharing with existing governments. Whereas the fascists are all about, let's get rid of the existing governments and just take power. Um, but more than anything, Tiso wants power. And so when Germany um, partitions Czechoslovakia, they put Tiso in power and he, with no qualms at all, it seems, mass murders all the Jews. Um, so this is a guy who's really not that interested in uh, anti-Semitism at all, but he uses it as a way to maintain power and to form friendships with Germany, which he sees will keep him in power. In Hungary, these guys are hardcore anti-Semites. They've got a long tradition of anti-Semitic politics and organizing and pogroms and killings of Jews. But, and they've had a far right dictator since 1920, 1920 um, Miklos Horthy. But, and he's a good friend with Germany. They're allied with each other, um, but he refuses to kill his Jews. He puts them in ghettos and he keeps them there until 1944 when Hitler gets sick of it and says, right, um, I'm sick of you not killing your Jews. So he invades, he puts the fascist arrow cross in power, and within a week, those Jews are all dead. But they had sat through the entire war, hearing rumours and seeing all the Jews elsewhere in Europe dying, um, and knowing that any moment they could be next and they couldn't do anything about it because they're stuck inside this ghetto. Um, and then all of a sudden, that's it. 
Um, so what happens in Croatia? Because of the amount of partisan movement in Croatia, the government doesn't really have control of the territory. And remember, this is a government run by a small handful of fanatics who've been living in Italy and Switzerland um, in exile for the last 12 years. They don't have networks inside the country. So they're basically, they've come in, they've tried to take control of an entire country and make it into a fascist regime um, while at the same time carrying out mass murder. And they didn't have the infrastructure or the resources or the expertise to basically revamp all of Croatia. Um, and the same, they had the same problem as the Ukrainians is that if they want to have an independent state of Croatia, they have to get rid of the Serbs. And so far more than killing Jews, they're much more interested in killing Serbs because they, there was only 38,000 Jews um, in Zagreb anyway. Um, but there are many more Serbs. And so they form um, concentration camps where they mass murder Serbs in barbaric ways. Um, but they also encourage local militias to carry out pogroms. Um, I call them pogroms, but sort of killing sprees uh, against Serbs to one village against another. Um, and frequently, these are um, Ustasha units, which were in large numbers of people get conscripted into the army, but they don't have enough weapons, they don't have enough food, um, they're drunk half the time. And so in order to get food and weapons, uh, or to get out of a difficult situation, they, they will um, like raise a village to the ground and, and kill, kill Serbs, um, just go local killing sprees. And this doesn't mean that there's orders from the top telling people how to do it. Um, although there were orders from the top explaining, you know, we need to set up camps and things like that. But um, there's large numbers of independent local perpetrators there. Um, and Rory Yeomans has said, um, in, in a fascinating book, he says, what is it that manages to hold Croatia together during World War II? Uh, and it, it's a really strong propaganda politics. Um, and they, they create new schools, they create magazines, radio programs, music, poetry, uh, and they try to say, we're, we're trying to create a new sort of human being who's a warrior um, and who's a superior person to everyone else, particularly from the degenerate Serbs. Uh, and so in a very, very short time, all of the, the sort of propaganda you associate with Nazi Germany, the Croatians developed their own version of that in a really, really short period of time. Um, and a lot of it is associated with the cult of death. Death is great. Death, uh, if you die as a hero, you die in battle as a martyr. If you kill people, that's even better. Um, it, it reminds me a lot of sort of ancient Sparta this society that, that valorizes um, warfare and martial qualities. Um, one other really interesting tank on this is Emily Grebler's work on Sarajevo, because Sarajevo is not Zagreb. Zagreb's the capital, and this is where the, the Ustasha are working out of. But Sarajevo is a much more multicultural city. It's always seen as sort of the second city in the country. It just defines itself against um, so, so think of like Liverpool and Manchester as opposed to London. Uh, if London tells you I want you to kill all your, your Jews, the very thing that London, Liverpool is going to do is say, no, just because you told me to, I'm going to do something different. Um, and she looks at local politics inside Sarajevo and she finds that the local governments in Sarajevo protect their Jews and their Muslims um, and their Orthodox Christians because the, the, um, the Ustasha are Catholic. So they want to kill um, Orthodox Christians as well. Um, and they deliberately lie to the government in Zagreb about um, how to define a Jew, how to define a Muslim, um, and then what, what to do um, and how to do it. And they're constantly resisting through these petty political um, things in order to keep some sort of sense of local identity and local power against Zagreb because they don't want to be have a, a new Croatia where they are not important anymore. Um, and so it's not necessarily about love your neighbor. It's got a lot more to do with um, love being in power in a small pond, love being a big fish in a small pond. Um, to turn to Romania then. Um, Romania is a much more similar story to what you get in Germany. But um, it starts in the summer of 1940. 
So in 1928, in January 1938, sorry, January 1938, um, democracy swings to the far right in Romania. The king doesn't want that. And so he establishes himself as a royal dictator. He allies the country with Nazi Germany and he starts um, introducing a fascist style sort of authorita conservative authoritarian regime with himself at the top. Um, but then with the Hitler-Stalin pact, Hitler, the Hitler-Stalin pact wasn't only about dividing up Poland and it only, wasn't only about not attacking each other. There was, it was also, a, the Soviet Union was, Union was allowed to invade Finland, for example. So the Russia-Finnish war is a result of the Hitler-Stalin pact. And the Soviet Union was allowed to involve, invade Bessarabia and Bukovina. These are two areas um, in Eastern Romania, which the Romanians had had since 1918. Um, yeah, 1918, they get these areas and the Soviet Union wants them back. And so they invade and the deal was the Hitler wouldn't fight back. And Hungary really wants Transylvania. And they've been claiming Transylvania since 1919 when the Romanians took it off them in the Hungar Hungaro the Hungarian-Romanian War of 1920. Um, and as part of the same treaty, they're, they're given Northern Transylvania. And the Romanians are so humiliated that they get rid of the king and they install a fascist dictatorship under a general named General Antonescu, working together with the Iron Guard, the fascist movement, which is also called the Legion of the Archangel Michael. And as the soldiers were leaving Bessarabia and Bukovina, these areas in the east, um, they mass murdered Jews on their way out. And they say, this is revenge because it's your fault we're losing this area. You guys are communist sympathizers. Uh, in one of the worst of those killings in Dodohoi, soldiers tortured, raped and pillaged Jewish families, um, leaving at least 200 people dead. And so you have a series of pogroms during the retreat um, carried out by Romanian soldiers. Antonescu, um, in, in January 1941, the, the Legion of the Archangel Michael don't like power sharing, mostly because they're crazy and anarchists. Um, they're not, they're fascists, they're not anarchists, but they're, um, they do what they feel like. And so they're, they're pillaging and robbing and putting themselves in special jobs. They're hopelessly corrupt. And Antonescu is a military man. He likes law and order. And so he keeps trying to rein them in. And they say, no, this is not okay. And so they stage a rebellion against him. In the course of the rebellion, they they murder hundreds of Jews in Bucharest. Uh, goes up, but after three days, they're wiped out. And so he puts their leaders in prison. He basically he rounds up everyone he can find associated with the fascist movement, puts them in prison, and establishes Romania as a military dictatorship. He allies Romania with Nazi Germany uh, again, and Romania is the third largest of the Axis armies in the European war. So after Italy and Germany, they would have the largest army. Um, 585,000 troops participate in Operation Barbarossa when they invade the Soviet Union in June and October. Um, they give massive amounts of oil and other raw materials, and they're the second largest perpetrator of the Holocaust on a state level. Um, so Operation Barbarossa tanks three armies, the Hungarian army, the Romanian army, and the German army. Um, the front is 1,800 miles long. 4.5 million troops, Axis troops, are involved in the invasion of Russia. And this is when the, um, the mass murder of Jews really begins on the ground. And Hungary and Romania, remember, they're fighting each other neck and neck because they've just lost, um, because of Northern Transylvania, they're, there's anger there that goes back decades. And, but they're supposed to be fighting on the same side. And whenever their two armies run into each other, there's clashes and violence. But so they, they do their best to keep their armies separate from each other while still invading next to each other. Um, and in their killings, they're, they're kind of um, trying to outperform one another in order to impress Hitler, who can, who can do the best. When, whenever they would have meetings with the Romanian leader and the Hungarian leader and Hitler together, Hitler would try to say, right, this is what we need to do strategically with the war and the Romanians and the Hungarians would both come with demographic figures and maps and history books trying to explain to Hitler why they deserved Northern Transylvania. Um, and so 
for them, what they were trying to win out of this war was to get Transylvania back. And as the Romanian troops advance into the Soviet Union, the first thing they do is mass murder Jews. Uh, probably the biggest of these pogroms happens in the city of Yash in June and July. Um, and it's not really clear what happened. It seems to have started with one or two soldiers. And what's interesting about these soldiers is they're former legionaries or they're identified by the army as former members of the Legion of the Archangel Michael. And the reason why that's important is the army wants to say it wasn't our fault because we, we know we didn't have orders to carry out a pogrom. Um, the Germans, there were some Germans in the city, but they were not remotely involved. Um, it was a mixture of soldiers and civilians. One of the leaders is Sergeant Micha Manolio. And um, Sergeant Manolio says, I grew up in the anti-Semitic spirit which poisoned most young people my age before the war. Uh, and that's a way of saying I used to be a, a fascist while I was young. But the idea that I should fulfill my duty developed easily in me. I thought like this at the time, thanks to the militaristic and anti-Semitic instruction and education that I've received during my three years in the army. And this is interesting because he says, I, I carried out that pogrom because the army taught me to be an anti-Semite, not because I had been involved in a fascist movement that was bound on, based on anti-Semitism, which is also true. Um, but the fact that he says, the army taught me to be an anti-Semite shows how deeply anti-Semitism had permeated the Romanian army at the time. Um, in July, 1941, it takes 300,000 soldiers, 24 days, conquer this region. So they're moving pretty fast. And in those, in that four weeks, seven, four is 20, 28. So yeah, almost four week period, roughly 63,000 Jews are murdered and by hand. So these are not um, death marches or concentration camps. This is just putting a gun to someone's head and shooting them. Historians believe that almost every single unit of the Romanian army, which made its way to the front, took part in the murder and the torture of Jews, uh, almost the entire Romanian army, which is different from the Wehrmacht. And so up until recently, historians have thought that the killers were really the Einsatzgruppe and the SS, and the Wehrmacht, the German soldiers, they were just there to fight a war. More recent research has suggested that, that no, actually the German soldiers, they were killers too, um, and the German army did some really brutal things. Um, but not, not on the scale that the Romanian army did. Um, and almost anyone involved in the Romanian army at this time, um, not all of them were, would have um, been involved in killing actions, but they all would have seen it um, or heard about it close hand. So who are the killers? Um, soldiers, but also gendarmes. Gendarmes, they're local policemen, but they're technically under the orders of the army. So they're technically part of the army, but they function as local policemen and have done for decades. And the, the gendarmes are the people who they put in control of the concentration camps when they set them up. Um, there's a lot of local collaborators and there's the Einsatzgruppen, the, the Einsatzgruppen B units. The, um, I've told you a little bit about these guys. One really interesting book about them that came out well, probably 25 years ago now is called Ordinary Men by Christopher Browning. I don't think I've got a slide there, no. Um, and he looks at one particular Einsatzgruppen unit and these uh, called Reserve Police Battalion 101. And these guys, they cared so little about the war effort that they didn't join the army, um, but they had to do something. So they became reserve policemen. It's, it's a nice way to have a job, pretend that you care and stay at home. Um, they're all family men mostly working class. None of them have any political involvement at all, except one guy who'd been involved in the Liberal Party. Um, but then one day a letter arrives and they said, you've been drafted into the SS. From now on, you're SS and we're going to send you to the front as an Einsatzgruppen unit. And the, um, the day before their first killing spree, the, um, the, the leader, the, the lieutenant said, um, we've got orders to just mass murder women and children tomorrow. Anyone that doesn't want to do it, you just tell me you don't have to do it. One guy came forward and said no. Um, these guys in, received a total of two hours of um, political training. So they had not been brainwashed as Nazis. Um, they really didn't, um, they weren't serious hardcore SS people, um, mostly family men. And you have stories of them walking 
like one guy walking into the woods with a five-year-old girl saying, oh, do you like ponies? I have a five-year-old girl at home and she likes ponies too. Um, and then he blows her brains out. Um, the only time these guys refused to, to shoot was during um, one of the one of the commanders of the unit got married um, during their tour, tour of duty, and he brought his wife with them, and that was like their honeymoon. And the soldiers said, no, we can't fire, we can't shoot in front of a German woman. Uh, and so they paid for him to go on his honeymoon somewhere else. But he always thought it was okay for him to bring his bride um, with him and with his unit as they were going around mass murdering um, Jews. So you don't need to have been a fascist, you don't need to have been an SS to be involved in this. But in Romania, there's a particular problem because the, the fascist movement had been wiped out in January 1941, and the Holocaust really begins in June 1941. So it's really clear that the fascists had nothing to do with the Holocaust. Um, and that's really nice and convenient for historians of fascism or for neo-Nazis and neo-fascists in Romania, because they can say, well, um, the Holocaust is a myth, but on top of that, we, um, we weren't involved anyway because we didn't exist anymore. Uh, a couple of years ago, I managed to do some research and follow individual um, fascists into the army because large numbers of prominent fascists, they were released from prison fairly soon after the rebellion. They joined the army as ordinary soldiers, and I can show you um, conclusively that they were on the ground in the units that were carrying out the killing. In almost no case do I find an example of a legionary or a former legionary being one of the ringleaders, but we know so little about most of these killings that um, we don't know who initiated them. What we can say is that people who had, an, had a past of anti-Semitic organising were there on the ground in, as members of the army that was doing the killing. Um, Mihai Poliek, uh, this book, The Holocaust in the Romanian Borderlands, comes out in two months. Um, it's, this is how new this sort of research is. Uh, he's interested in civilian complicity. Um, what is it that makes a civilian um, want, to, want to kill? And he, he argues that eliminating the Jews socioeconomically and physically was seen as a test of loyalty to the government and as a way to show that I deserve to be in a position of authority. So you make me a mayor, you make me a chief of police, I will kill all the Jews in my region. Um, it was also about, um, possibly about personal advancement or enrichment, but for many people, it was just about, well, I really hate Jewish people. Um, it was, they, they're doing it because of anti-Semitism. Uh, another slightly older book, this is probably 15 years old now, Jean Anchel's work. Jean Anchel is the great historian of the Romanian Holocaust, like he knows more than anyone else. Um, and this is a really short book where he, he shows that time and time again, it was about money. Because there's these myths that the Jews are super rich and they might not look super rich, but they're, they're tricky, these Jews, and they're always hiding it. And so what you do is you, you what, this is the sort of stories that Anshel tells, is um, they would round the Jews up, they would bring them to the police station and torture them until they tell them where they hid all the money. Um, and then they would tank all the money the Jews had, and then they would torture them again, because clearly the Jews are tricky and they would have lied. And there wasn't nearly as much money as we know the Jews really had. And so um, you keep torturing them like that. Um, he also tells stories of columns of Jews being marched east. And local peasants would just come up and you could buy a Jew. You say to a soldier, oh, I'll give you five bucks for that guy. And the soldier says, sure, and shoots the, the Jewish person in the head. And then you take his gold tooth or his ring or his watch or anything you can find on him. So you get to you, you buy living corpses. Um, and he shows the, the way that one of the largest motives for um, people killing the Jews was to take their money. Um, and this, this is from the very top. General Antonescu is like, yes, we need the, Jews, the money of the Jews in order to pay for this war, um, right down to the very lowest peasant who wants to kill a Jew to make a couple of extra bucks. Um, and this raises a question which has been bothering historians for a very long time and was solved, I think, about two years ago by Michael Rothberg. And Michael Rothberg's brought up this idea of what he calls the implicated subject. 
And so in the past, we've always talked about victims, perpetrators, bystanders, and maybe collaborators. But it's a, it's a tricky word. Uh, it's a tricky concept. And what do you do with all these people who they didn't necessarily help the killing, but they didn't stop it either? Um, and he says they, they implicated people. They op occupy positions allied with power and privilege without bringing themselves directly, being themselves direct agents of harm. They contribute to, inhabit, inherit, or benefit from regimes of domination, but do not originate or control such regimes. So um, say you're a British person, you're a white British male um, living under Boris Johnson's government, and you're watching them actively discriminate against Romanians and Poles and um, migrants and asylum seekers and refugees, and you're not the one doing that right? Um, but you're implicated. You're watching it, you're seeing it, and you're benefiting, you're benefiting from a system that systematically um, persecutes other people. And Rothberg is an American Jew, and so he says um, most Jewish people in Israel are implicated subjects in the, um, the, the slow genocide of the Palestinian people. Um, white Jews in America benefit systematically from the um, the discrimination against people of colour. And this is the same way that we should be thinking about ordinary Germans and ordinary Romanians in this sort of situation. Um, and it's that privilege, it's that ethnic privilege that encouraged people not to speak up and not to do anything about it. Um, but this is where some of the most interesting research is going on. Um, these are another, Volha Karnish and Evgeny Sitfinkel, another couple of political scientists who like counting things. And they looked at the Treblinka death camp um, in 2017, and they said, let's, let's assume that, so their, their, their guess was, if all these Jews are, and soldiers are coming to this, this little town in the middle of nowhere, um, where there really wasn't anything, like there's not a train station, there's not roads, um, and no one's really been there before, um, like it's not a commercial hub, but suddenly all these people are coming, the local towns should benefit from that, right? Because the soldiers have to go out and buy some food. Um, there might be Jews trying to bribe people in the village to, to get things. Um, and so there should be economic fallout for the locals around the concentration camp. Um, and they say, how could we possibly find out if this is true? So they say, let's look at how many buildings were built um, around Treblinka after the war, in the, the 25 years immediately after World War II. And what you find is the closer you get to Treblinka, the more buildings are built immediately following the war. And on top of that, they say houses with metal roofs um, show that people have money to spend because a metal roof is kind of, it's a status symbol. And the closer you get to Treblinka, the more houses are being built with metal roofs. Um, and so they're able to show fairly conclusively, the closer you were to Treblinka, the more money you made from the, the death camp. And that doesn't mean that you were one of the killers. It doesn't mean that you approved of it even, but it means you made money out of it. You're implicated in it, right, in some way. The, Vladimir Solonari last year brought out a book called A Satellite Empire, where he looks at the, this region, which we call Transnistria. Um, so the Romanians, they didn't kill inside Romania. I mean, the, 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 the local village killings that I'm talking about in the east of the country, yes. But um, where's a good map? So here's a map of Romania. If you have a look at the Prut River, this is, um, this is a river that the fight divides sort of Moldova, traditional Moldova, where Yash and Dorohoi is, from Bessarabia, uh, and further north around Chernowitz is Bohina, um, Bukovina. And then the Dniester River, beyond the Dniester is Transnistria, which means like the other side of the Nistru, the Nistru River. Uh, and that area is the area that the Romanians controlled, and that's where they built their concentration camps. Um, and this is interesting because... Romanians, they persecuted Jews throughout the whole country, but they mass murdered them only in the eastern borderlands. And why is that? And Solonati's first book 
was he said, what they're trying to do is they're trying to show that they control this region that they otherwise hadn't controlled. They feel like we're not in total control of this area because we only just received, received it from the Russians. We haven't, um, we need to, to prove that it's ours. Uh, and that's why they kill specifically in those borderland regions. And you see a similar story in Bulgaria. Bulgarians very famously say, we didn't kill any Jews in the Holocaust. Bulgaria is like the righteous among nations. The truth is Bulgarians didn't kill inside the, the, the Bulgarian nation state, but they also controlled large swaths of Macedonia. And in those regions, they mass murdered the Jews. Uh, and so in areas where they don't feel like they completely control it, in borderlands, they'll, they'll carry out mass killings, but areas that are, that are the center of the state, they, they feel no need. Um, but this book, Solonati, is looking at how did this new state work? Like what was, how did the administration function? Uh, and then how did locals respond to it? And what he finds is the locals, many of whom were ethnic Romanians who had been living under Russian occupation since the beginning of time, um, they quite welcomed it. Um, they either collaborated it or accommodated the soldiers. They didn't try to resist until much later. Near the end of the war, they got so sick of the corruption of the Romanians that they actively helped the Soviet resistance movement. Um, but in the early years of the war, they were actually very sympathetic. Um, Jonut Biliutsa last year um, looked at the Orthodox clergy. So Romania um, had just taken this territory and they said, it's been administered by the Russian Orthodox Church that hasn't really looked after Romanian Orthodox Christians properly. And so they set up, they sent missionary teams, like hundreds of priests as missionaries to Transnistria um, to help admin, um, set up Romanian churches there. And most of those priests were actively involved in exploiting, robbing, and murdering local Jews and deportees. So the Orthodox Church um, not only preached, what you guys are doing is great. God wants you to carry out the Holocaust God wants you to defeat the atheist communists, um, but we can find them in the concentration camps participating in the killing sometimes. Um, and I think this is where I'm no, almost finished. Um, Diana Dimitru says, actually, the difference between Bessarabia and Transnistria gives us a really interesting case study because in Bessarabia, the Romanians, the, the local people actively killed Jews, like they were the ones doing the pogroms um, and murdering their neighbours. In Transnistria, the, the local population, sometimes they collaborated, but more often than not, they, they, didn't, they didn't do anything. And we actually have quite a few stories of rescue accounts of people, locals helping, helping the Jews. But you don't get those rescue accounts in Bessarabia. And she said, why? Why did Bessarabians rob and murder deportees, but Transnistrians didn't carry out mass violence against Jews? And her theory is that the Soviet Union during the 1920s and 30s was preaching um, this doctrine that said, there are no such things as ethnic groups. We're all just workers. We're all just people. Um, we need to get along and all be subjects of Stalin. Whereas the Romanians during the 1920s and 30s were teaching Romanians are better than Jews. Jews are evil. Romanian nation state, awesome. Um, and 20 years of state propaganda encouraged the Bessarabians to become killers, whereas 20 years of Soviet propaganda encouraged the Transnistrians not to kill and actually to help each other. And therefore, she argues, top down, what, what the government says matters. Um, the rhetoric of government and what you get in schools makes a big difference. Um, and Dallas Mikkelbacher, I get this is another book that came out last year. He looks at forced labor and forced labor in Germany was a way of killing Jews, right? You, um, you work them to death. In Romania, no, it was badly organized. The conditions were horrible for the workers. Uh, it was far from pleasant, but it wasn't a tool of genocide. Compared to the way that Germans treated their forced laborers, Romanians um, were very mild and Jewish forced labor was not um, part of an attempt to annihilate the Jewish people. It was a part, it was a way of trying to get free labor from them, um, which is an interesting contrast 
to, to what the Germans are doing. Um, yeah, I'm just going to jump to the end and say the purpose of all of this is never again, right? The reason why we talk about the Holocaust ad nauseum is to say, no, this sort of genocide should not happen. Um, and yet we do so little about it when we see it happening. 